Well, how can I not say, hello, everybody? <laughs> Thank you. And I was very impressed about all the mingling and the um, getting together and the buzz that was present in the courtyard in the breaks. You've all obviously been exchanging ideas, the whole purpose of um, getting together for TEDx Perth and being able to um, really highlight the, the important issues that are confronting us as a community. And hopefully you're sitting next to someone, the organisers were hoping that you would sit next to someone you don't necessarily know so you can share ideas with someone new. And you might have noticed some things about them, what they're wearing, what their face looks like. You might have exchanged some ideas about what you do, who you are, things of that nature. But the one thing that you won't be able to do, no matter how long you know a person, is predict their future. Now, we can make some sensible, educated guesses about them, but what you won't be able to do, and some of us would like to be able to predict things like, will we get the job? Will we win the lottery? Will that person go out with me? Now, in the medical world, we want to be able to predict whether or not a person's going to develop a disease, and if they do develop that disease, what, how will that disease run its course? We are entering into a phase in which DNA and our understanding of genetics and more broadly genomics, the concept of proteins, epigenetics, all of the things that interact with the genome and the environment are able to give us insights to make more educated predictions about how a person may fare into their future. And this is at the core of what we're now beginning to term predictive and preventative and personalised medicine. And what's really enabling this is our ability to sequence the human genome. The rapidity of the fall in the cost of sequencing, that very sharp line that you see here, is really what's burgeoning our ability to use genetics in the clinic today. But you'll also notice another curve on here, a more flat line curve, which is referred to as Moore's Law. And this is a curious thing, because it's not a law at all. It's a prediction by Gordon Moore that the cost of computing that would fall, as well as the density of transistors and the speed of computing. And what you can see here is it's tailed off in 2012, 2013, that sequencing itself is now low cost, but it's generating a huge volume of data. And we simply don't have the computational power to assess that. To solve these problems, we have to be able to share this data with as many people as possible. There aren't enough scientists and medical scientists and computational scientists employed to actively do research to actually solve these problems. This is the difficulty we're confronted with. And so initiatives have begun to try and harmonise all of the scientists around the world and even to go out to those people who may not classically have thought of themselves as research scientists to try and solve this. It's going to be made even more difficult by projects like the 100,000 Genome Project. The huge wash of data that's going to come through once we start doing personalised genomes. How many people here would have their personal genome done if it cost less than $1,000? Show of hands. So quite a number of you would do it. And we know that people like to share information about themselves, and patient groups have now started to generate websites to share ideas. How many people go to Dr. Google to find out, do, does someone else have that rash and why, why do I have it? <laughs> and you suddenly discover that there's thousands of people out there that share the same problem as you. And so a problem shared is a problem diminished, and this is extremely important for us. And the one thing that you find out when you do genomic studies is that we're all actually mutants. If you look around the room, all of you have genetic variations. That's why you look different to one another. Unless you're sitting next to your identical twin, and even then, there will be epigenetic differences between you. This is my chest. It's not actually my chest. It's a pseudo-impression of my chest. But I have a mutation in my alpha-1 antitrypsin gene, which you all know, of course. Um, <laughs> will mean, in simple terms, that my lungs will turn to gravy if, ever, if I'm ever stupid enough to smoke cigarettes. Now, you'd think this is a terrible thing to have, the burden, the likelihood that I'm going to get emphysema as I grow older. But I can remedy this. I can not smoke, I can avoid pollution, and I can take exercise, which will raise my lung capacity. So rather than thinking about the negative elements about knowing your genetic information, and of course, I work with people who find out that they have a hereditary form of cancer. Do we tell their relatives? Some of them don't want to know. We know that women who are at high risk of breast cancer, they have a potential to carry the breast cancer susceptibility gene, BRCA1, do not want to find that information out. 
So there's a flip side to this, that if we start sequencing everybody, maybe there'll be some information there that people don't want to know. What if it halted your chances of getting employment, finding a partner, having children, if it affects your reproductive choices, insurance, health accessibility? All of these things start to become a problem. And one of the problems is, is that people like to pry. People like to know things about you. Now, you ask people, one of the first things that people say to one another is, what do you do for a living? Well, that's sharing quite a bit of intimate knowledge. We do want to select what we reveal and what we don't reveal. And one of the things that's emerged from these databases that are being put up of genetic information is that they're now being cross-linked to information present on other types of websites. Well, these computer scientists here earlier this year were able to take name-identified information from an Ancestry website and link it to a disease registry and re-identify a person having a particular disease. So what's the antidote? Do we just lock up all the computers? Do we put in security? Well, of course we do. We have to have some level of security, password protection. Though if you're not using at least a, a 12 um, character password, it's not really going to work very effectively for you. And I work a great deal in ethics and policy, and the focus is absolutely on locking down systems. And this is creating significant problems with the work that we're doing. So, is the antidote to the risk of having information out there on the web to lock things down and to control it? Well, first of all, let's really think about what we're saying. You're not the sum total of your DNA. We know that epigenetics, environmental factors, are highly important. So the idea that there is an absolute risk is only true of some very selected diseases. The fundamental problem we have is not about the information. It's about what we do with the information. Is that information going to be used to discriminate against you? In this slide, there is a genetic mutation that you can see, or a genetic variation, some would call it a mutation. And that's a Y chromosome, presence or absence of. And we wouldn't accept sexism, we reject sexism these days, and yet that, in many ways, is a genetic variability. So the antidote, perhaps, is not just to reject the fact that we are not just regulated by our genes, but equally, that it is wrong to discriminate, period. We should not be discriminating against people. And I suppose the problem for some people is it doesn't need, they don't necessarily have to have their data in a database for people to recognise that they have a genetic variation. But just as these group of individuals are reclaiming what they see as being vitally important, that their dignity, their humanity and how we treat them should not be dictated by the presence or absence of an additional chromosome. So, we have a situation in which we are in this most exciting of times that we can sequence and understand the human genomic information. This is our person on the moon moment. This is an incredible science. We need to share that information. But legislation and guidelines are having a realistic impact on diminishing that. Now, you're all taxpayers, and you've all, no doubt, who here has made a donation to a medical research charity at some point in their life? I'm sure you would not want the money that you've donated to go towards the regulatory framework. Far better, I think, is that we don't panic and we focus on being a more kind society. Thank you.